That's a good combination of topics. Okay. My topic for today is rather new. In fact, I would like to adopt, adopt of what Professor Wecker uh, showed in one of his slides. I, I forgot the author, but uh, it doesn't mean that I can speak about it. I'm already an expert on this. But, uh, I'm also new in, the, in this topic. But it interested me because uh, it's because of its of the possibilities at the same time because of the dangers of, of the technology. So we have augmented eternity and digital remains. Uh, Professor Osama was talking about you know becoming healthy, being healthy, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. But uh, this one is about what if you can have eternity. What if you don't die at all, at least digitally, no, digitally? So it's possible after all. So what is augmented eternity? And what is, uh, uh, what's the relationship of augmented eternity to digital remains? I believe you know what digital remains are. But uh, this afternoon, I will be talking about death technology. I hope you're familiar with death technology. So even death now is controlled by technology. Now, of course, some um, information, digital remains, and mental eternity, some issues and concerns, and this uh, conclusion. Uh, so in Christ ancient Christian tradition, we have a saying, memento mori, meaning we will die anyway. <laughs> Eventually, you will die. <laughs> And that's one thing that is undeniable. They say there are two absolute realities in the world. Number one is you are born, and the second absolute reality is you will die. <laughs> so, uh, so, why do people die? Memento mori, and that's the normal symbol that we use to describe memento mori. Well, why do we die? Scientists will say because of entropy, eventually, the event of death of everything. We know what entropy is uh, when the energy that sustains life becomes less and less and soon everything dies. The second reason they gave is the logic of evolution for science. We die so others may leave. No, we die so others may leave. So it's part of the, the way things are. But Cicero, you know him, he said the life of the dead is placed in the memory of the living. The life of the dead is placed in the memory of the living. But apparently it is becoming more than remembering. Soon the time will come, and it has already begun, that uh, it will not only be the memory, but even the person itself, in its physical form, can be seen, can be, I don't know, it can be felt, it can be seen or even heard. Even after death, ready or not, the technology is here, and the technology is, I think, uh, cannot be regulated because it is something that is inevitable with the advances of science and technology. Now, why are why is technology interested in death? Well, number one is there seems to be a human pension to for eternity and talking to the dead. In philosophy, the search for the lapis philosophorum, or the what is that, <laughs> philosopher's stone that apparently it can turn things into gold. And another property of the philosopher's stones can give you uh, it, longer life or even eternity, probably. Other cultures do have traditions of uh, talking to the dead by spiritism or by other methods of you know, contacting the spirits of the dead. I mean, I think among Asians, this is quite uh, normal among cultures in Asia. Even in the West, of course, and even in the West. Now, there are different movements that would like to cheat death. First are the cryonicists. Uh, cryonicists, these are, their motto is freeze, wait, and reanimate. You freeze, you wait, and reanimate. So the soul in this scenario is the self as stored in memory. So the private preservation of memory preserves the self indefinitely until the day when medical technologies can come online to reanimate the memory. Currently, this is done by vitrification of the brain, but don't trust the technology yet. 
It is according to results of experimentation on animals once the brain is vitrified and you reanimate it, the, some functions of the brain are definitely compromised. And the integrity of the brain itself as a functioning cell is also compromised. So these are the pioneers. And there are people in some countries that are that have signed up for cryopreservation after death, believing that they can be reanimated after several years once medicine and technology is so advanced that they can reanimate cryopreserved bodies. Other groups are the extropians. These are people who are against entropy. What do extropians believe? They believe that it is our sorry, it is our responsibility to you know to do something for us to live longer. What else? For us to be more intelligent, for us to have greater wisdom, uh, improve physical and mental health, become better than previous generations. Um, what? For what? I cannot see that. Help. <laughs> so the extropians, they normally reject uh, the effect of entropy. So they do things to help us have more energy to support human activity and to counter the effects of the loss of energy in the human body. Uh, we also have the, the transhumanists, uh, you know the transhumanists, uh, they intend to transform the human condition first through lifestyle choices involving diet and exercise. So if you encounter people who encourage you to do, to do diet, like uh, what Osama said, <laughs> or ketogenic diet, the other one that's uh, famous and yet controversial, uh, and do exercise, then, um, then through body enhancements, body part replacements, and genetic engineering. All of these, the goal is to take control of evolution and transform the species into something stronger, faster, sexier, healthier, and with thus the superior cognitive abilities. Probably I recruit transhumans, but like the other parts there. Sexier, healthier, who wouldn't like to be like that? No. And of course, the other group are the singularitarian mind upholders. These are new in the cheating death movement. What do singularitarian mind upholders do? They transfer your cell or soul, meaning the pattern of information that uh, represents your thoughts and memories, as is stored in the connection of your brain, into a computer. So they upload your brain and memories into a computer. That's what they are called singularitarian mind uploaders. So all of these are movements that would like to cheat death, death or change our very definition of death, or altogether remove death as a human reality. Now, that leads us to the development of death technology. So welcome to the world of tech technology where the dead leaders and the living perish. <laughs> the living dies and the dead resurrected. So what are death technologies? A death technology is the use of technology to preserve life after death or completely redefine or even eliminate the very concept of death. And there are several technologies available in the market today. Um, they are quite free. You can, you know, use them like Ethereum Me. I actually accessed the program. I created my profile. We have Replica, uh, the chat robots or chatbots for those who have died already and they would like to preserve their memory. Of course, Augmented Eternity, which is an app that was developed by a um, um, businessman and technocrat in the U.S. Well, there are other uh, apps that are being developed today, that are being developed. What are the raw materials of that technology? Our digital remains. Our digital remains. So what do you mean by digital remains? Uh, these are our internet activities. No? These are our Facebook posts, our Twitter reactions, etc., etc. So these are the data used to create digital avatar and augmented eternity. So if we bury our mortal remains, what happens to our digital remains? They remain. <laughs> While the body perish, your digital remains remain. So when someone passes away, we need to deal with his or her digital remains. So the problem with digital remains, 
is as a material for that technology. The boundaries around acceptable afterlife activity and grief exploitation have become increasingly unclear. Say, Jack Derrida, for example, when he was interviewed before the release of the film Ghost Dance, uh, 1982, I don't know if you've watched the film Ghost Dance. In his interview, he said, I believe the future belongs to ghosts and that the modern technologies of imagery, cinematography, and telecommunication increases the strength of ghosts and has hastened their return. In the reader's uh, deconstruction, the spirit of ghosts hunts much of his attempts to deconstruct reality. Okay, and as a form of presence they've been absence, ghosts overcome the dualism of life and death, at least in Derrida's understanding. You know, Derrida believes that to write was to commit a being to write was to commit to being a ghost in progress. Uh, with each line you create, a rift within yourself, since that line will continue to speak to people long after you die. So while you are writing and sharing things online, you are creating a ghost of yourself. Since once you're dead, whatever you wrote, whatever you said online, will continue to exist. So while you are commenting, writing posts, etc., etc., online, you are creating a ghost of yourself. So technically, you are a ghost in progress. <laughs> you are a ghost. In so it can be inferred or deduced that each recorded trace is a ghost in the making. Okay. So in the reader's logic, we call he, he called this ontological process. <laughs> ontological process. Now. Facebook and experimental startup companies are monetizing these contents by allowing people to socialize with the dead online. Socialize with the dead online. Say, for example, Facebook. I don't know. I believe all of us we have a Facebook account. I deactivated my Facebook four months ago uh, for my digital detox. <laughs> I don't know when will I activate it again. Although I'm still live in Messenger, but uh, in Facebook and not. Facebook in 2014 announced some changes in his deceased user policy. I don't know if you are reading the terms and conditions when you created your Facebook account. Or you just click it and then it's okay. <laughs> the other part of the terms and conditions of FB, they have a deceased user policy. So what happens to your file after your death? I, I, if you read it, I believe you don't like what you will realize after reading the terms and conditions. Now, in 2014, they revised that this is the user policy because of some complaints of violation of uh, privacy and data management. And this, this is the new policy. Okay. Uh, the first that they change is the visibility of a deceased person's content remains as it was set by the account holder while alive. So if you set your FB account public, once you're dead, it will remain public. Okay, it will remain public. Now, so a confirmed FB friend of a deceased user can now request a look back video from a deceased user's account. So any of your friends in your FB can request FB to release that, to, to release whatever you have in the FB, and they can use your files for whatever purposes. So according to the policy, if FB is made aware that a person has passed away, FB says it's our policy to memorialize the account. What do we mean by memorializing the account in FB? Number one, the word remembering will appear in your profile. Remembering. <laughs> Second is, friends can share memories on the memorialized timeline. So they can freely share your memories. <laughs> and content is visible to the audience that this was shared with. So, it will end up, it will continue to exist. So why not provide digital funerary services? <laughs> So can we have uh, funerary services for our digital remains? Okay. Of course, we can't have that. That's why augmented eternity came. Uh, it was developed. And what do you mean by augmented eternity? Augmented eternity lets you create a digital persona that can interact with people on your behalf after your death. Some people call it digital immortality. It is based on augmented reality. We know AR, an uh, interactive experience of a real-world environment where the objects that reside in the real world are enhanced by computer-generated personal information. 
global defense. Sometimes the images, information are developed across multiple sensory modalities. It can be visual, auditory, haptic, somato sensory, and olfactory. Now, one of the earliest developed apps for augmented eternity is Eternity. This is the opening page of Eternity. What if you could preserve your parents' memories forever? You could preserve your legacy for the future. You can live on forever as a digital avatar. Would you like to live on forever as a digital avatar? No, I prefer cloning. <laughs> <laughs> At least you still have a body. <laughs> Rather than just existing digitally. <laughs> okay. This system learns the user's opinion on different topics and feeds them through neural network. Uh, to absorb their tone and approach to varied situations, thereby creating an appearance of their personality. A good example is what is happening in the US now. Um, you know, you can access it. the new dimensions in testimony project uh, by the Institute of Creative Technologies at the University of Southern California and the Shiro Foundation. I was hoping uh, uh, Tony Vito is here, but uh, because this is about the survivors of the Holocaust. So what they are doing is, they created about a dozen of interactive biographies of Holocaust survivors based on extensive interviews filmed on a set with 360 degree cameras. These testimonies are used to create a digital protection, protection that can answer questions from the public. So the intention is to give the impression of a perfect, a perfect conversation with a witness to the story. So even if the whole of the survivors are already dead. You can still interact with them and you can still ask questions and they can still answer. So according to Shoma Foundation, years from now, long after the last survivor has left us, the measures and testimony will be able to provide a valuable opportunity to engage with the survivor and ask them questions directly. So if you ask them questions, they can give you answers, even if they're already dead. Thanks to AI okay. and of course, augmented eternity technology. So attorney, I don't know if it's attorney me or attorney me. Okay, probably it's me. Me, make me eternal. <laughs> attorney me. Uh, that tech, it's a company now, okay? Founded in 2014 and hopes to make people virtually immortal by creating a digital avatar of people after they die. Uh, simply becoming mortal. It's very tempting, right? So attorney me collects data about you in two ways. Automatically harvesting heaps of smartphone data. So careful with the things that you put in your smartphones. And by asking you questions through a chat book. So you log into the app, and then somebody interviews you. And then everything you say, or all your answers will be reported, and it will be used in creating your avatar. The founder of this is Marius or Sanchez. So what do they collect? According to him, they collect geolocations where where did you go for the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Where would you like to go? Where are you now? What did you do in those places? Okay, who you interacted with in those places? Even motion. So for example, that's one issue with Fitbit today. They can already download your data from Fitbit and sell it to companies. So they know how many times you jog a day, your heartbeat rate, blah, 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 blah. So they can download the data. It's one of the issues of big data today. Even your sleep data, they will get it. And of course, photos, messages that users put in the app. And we also collect, according to Marius, FB data from external sources. Now, if you ask me whether that's with consent or not, that will come later. Now, there is another technocrat who created another app following augmented eternity and used it as an of this app, Renama, uh, MIT, from MIT. He created a program and he called it Augmented Eternity also. It builds upon the digital archive a person has left behind. So he fits this digital info into an artificial neural network that is able to think for itself. The person's digital being continues to evolve after his physical being is passed on. In this way, Augmented Eternity book, uh, robot would keep aware of current events, develop new opinions, and become an entity that is based on a real person rather than a facsimile of who they are at the time of death. So they can even 
They can even update themselves with current events. They're already dead, but they are updating themselves with current events, with new information. So that when you ask them about anything, they can give you an answer that is not obsolete, but updated. So imagine, that may not be you, but the you has evolved into something that learns digitally. Digitally. Now, <clears throat> of course, it may be very tempting to live eternal, in an eternity. But there are some issues and concerns here. Number one is augmented eternity. First issue is the issue of borrowable identities or swappable identities. This uh, philosophy of swappable identity in augmented reality eternity, you can swap identities. You can borrow the identities of another. Just three days ago, I was reading in the newspaper about a hospital in California, in California I think, who diagnosed patients using a chatbot, but using the face of Aristotle. So you are actually talking to Aristotle, and Aristotle will actually diagnose your psychological condition. And one of those two underwent such uh, uh, therapy said, after a minute or two talking to Aristotle, you actually believe that he is an actual person. Because it looks like a person you are conversing with, uh, and he behaves, acts, talks, speaks, with all the mannerisms, even the ah uh and the o oh and the ah, uh, they are all there while you are talking. So, the belief of borrowable or swappable identity is by enabling our digital identity to perpetuate, we can significantly contribute to the global expertise and enable a new form of intergenerational collective intelligence. This project uses a distributed machine intelligence network to enable its user to control the growing digital footprint, turn it into their digital representation, and share it as a part of a social network. So the project creates um, an evolving ontological mapping of an individual based on her or his digital interactions, and allow the person to represent her aggregated knowledge based on what software agents would like this identity to be. So, just imagine a deceased expert in a field can be borrowed to provide answers to some questions or clarifications of some concepts. Or a deceased friend or relative can be borrowed to help one decide on a matter of particular importance. Or a deceased specialist probably can be consulted for a medical operation on what to do with a particular medical condition or a matter of particular importance. But the one that you are consulting is already dead. But they can still give you responses or answers. Now, the problem with this is the algorithmizing, algorithmizing human conversation devoid of context and humanity. That's the first problem. It may be a conversation, but it is devoid of context. The context is gone. You may be talking to, a, to your digital self, to an avatar, but the context of the responses is not there. Imagine, if through AI, it will just look at what has been recorded and put them together. So what did you say about this 10 years ago? That will be the response. But the problem is, what if you change your mind after 10 years and 15, you know, 18 or 20 years after you said it, you change your mind, and you said something else that is against what you said 10 years ago? The computer will just you know, randomly pick any answer to a particular question you ask, and that will be the response. So it, devoids, it, it is devoid of context in humanity. Another issue and problem is the semantics and logic of human reality is digitalized. Okay. Randomness of meaning, of course. Can we securely borrow their identity and ask a question with the confidence of receiving a relevant and valuable answer? And of course, the issue of prior consent. Who owns the data? Can software agents become our digital heirs? To what extent can the borrowed identity be used? Of course, you will already be dead. You don't have any control anymore of your identity or of your data. They can use it in whatever ways they would like to use it. Or how will digital identities be valued? Will they be accorded the same rights and privileges like living humans? Or, or not? Okay. Another problem with this is <clears throat> the human and social context of reality. They say reality is in the context of the beholder. Reality becomes meaningful and functional because of its context. 
So but perception of reality is subjective and arbitrary, and we know that. Perception is not reality. Just because you think something is reality doesn't make it a reality. Okay, perception can become a person's reality because perception has a potent influence on how we look at reality. What we perceive as digital avatars can become a reality to some. Even the advices and decisions they offer may become more realistic than actual person's advices or words. So human relationship and conversation becomes truly human when it is done within the context of the human family. Human and social realities are constructed not by the logic of algorithms and technology, but by the very interaction between humans and the meaning produced by such interactions. Another thing is the reality of death and the dignity of the human person. We all believe that death is the end, but is it? Today, is it the end? When you die, is that your end? Remember, you have digital remains. Can we not let the dead rest in peace? Or rest in pieces? <laughs> okay. Can we blame the dead for a mistake we have committed because of an out of context advice or decision? So, human dignity requires that digital remains, seen as the informational course of the deceased, may not be used solely as a means to an end, such as profit, but it must be regarded instead as an entity holding an inherent value. Okay, we know that death is the end of human life. Creating a dead person's digital avatar with random ideas and posts made online as context and context of conversation and interaction violates not only the mental integrity of the dead, but also his very dignity as a human person. Another issue is the creation of deep faith by, and of course, issues of security and truth. What are deep faiths? Uh, I know somebody talked about, of course, our favorite um, Trump, Donald. Uh, he was a victim of deep faith. Uh, one of, before the meeting in Germany at the World Economic Forum, a video was released. Apparently, Trump is saying, denying climate change and you know, bashing the, the agreement that was made in Paris, blah, 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 blah. And many people believe it. In fact, they bash Trump. And we just continue bashing him. <laughs> but many people believe it, especially in Europe. But then eventually, it was revealed that it was created by a 28-year-old 20 boy, a man, who was an activist on environment using the fake technology, they can bury your identity. So deep fake is a forgery created by a neural network. It's a type of deep machine learning model that analyzes video footage until it is able to algorithmically transpose the skin of one human face onto the movement of another as if they are one and the same. So deep fake is a real danger since it can undermine everything. And again, reality is in the eye of the beholder. The precautionary principle is a wise principle. We have to realize that the unintended consequences that occur with technological inventions and innovations are very hard to foresee and insulate against. So we also need to remember that the bioethics principles of doing good and avoiding harm, coupled with respect for human dignity and integrity. Uh, Deepfakes can be a threat to democracy and human and global security. They compromise the truth or redesign the truth into half-truths of altogether lie. Again, reality is in the eye of the beholder. So deepfakes can be, the tool can become a weapon. So it can be that culturally we may be in the middle of a future shockwave, not quite understanding how these technologies still root in reality. Big packeting pieces of the physical, digitalizing them, quantifying them, and then sending them off without a second thought to unintended consequences of engineering technologies that are maybe benevolent and beneficial to some, constructive even for others, but without safeguarding them against the inverting of purpose that runs along the double edged sword that is innovation and invention. Here is a sample of a defect. You know him? It's that Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy. And of course, Trump. Look. They behave similarly, but the face is quite different. So just imagine if you propagate the video 
putting different words into the mouth of any influential person. And then some people watch you. Again, perception is in the eye of the beholder. Their perception of what was said will become their reality. It can create problems, big problems, not only in security and truth, but even in democracy. Just imagine Trump declaring war against a country and people will believe it. Of course, even intelligence one, once can be fooled by the fakes. And not because people are intelligent, that doesn't mean they cannot be fake. <laughs> so, <clears throat> that's just an example. I was looking for the video of Trump uh, on Paris Climate Change Agreement, but uh, I wasn't able to find one. I think it was taken down as reported being fake. So, or reflecting further. Now, some questions like, will machine intelligence replace human intelligence, for example? Probably in the future, teachers will become obsolete already. If we can have Plato and Aristotle teaching, we will also be, why have another teacher teach me who is only a secondary source? If I can resurrect Plato and put all his books and ideas into the computer and listen to him lecturing me about the soul and its parts, blah, 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 why? What's the need of having an actual human person teaching me a secondhand knowledge of what you can actually hear from a person? Will artificial intelligence become more dominant than human intelligence? And of course, who controls who and who controls what? Uh, the question of what defines ethical technology will likely metamorphose slowly into the coming years. And answering it may not be possible today. But safeguarding against unintended consequences, against weaponization of innovations and inventions, is a technological challenge we're taking on. They say technology is inherently about humans, and it is perilous to ignore social and psychological impact while creating them. Synthetic resurrection by augmented eternity has adverse psychological, social, ontological, and even eschatological consequences for religion. Just imagine the entering from death and resurrection. <laughs> it makes the spiritual reality of death a laughing stock and a technological toll. So I think ethics is being left behind. I hope not. <laughs> The fast obsolescence of things because of fast changes in technology and science. Sometimes we realize that we in the ethics area are being left behind. The principle of self-regulation in science and technology rests on the conviction that scientists and innovators and engineers can discipline themselves and are aware of the scope and limitations of their fields. But how far can self-regulation be trusted? How far can self-regulation be trusted? Uh, I think, I don't know, some years ago, Disney, Disney company claimed that uh, restrictions to digital afterlife technologies could stifle creative freedom. But is creative freedom a more important value? So I believe, uh, personally, I must be assured as a person that even after death, I remain in control over my digital afterlife and rights to my self-image. So we must draw the line between respectful recreation and commercial exploitation. So, uh, so digital remains should be treated with the same care and respect as physical remains. We need to ensure that generative AI and synthetic media are developed responsibly, encouraging potentially positive applications while ensuring they do not unwittingly cause harm. There is a need to create a code of practice. In the European Union, they have, I think, that uh, in light of augmented eternity, I think they need to update also their code of conduct and practice. The technology is so fast, and code of conduct and code of practice are so slow, because sometimes political matters come into the debate, and that makes the creation of code of conduct rather slow. There is a need for a wider societal discussion, about whether some areas of human interaction should be treated as sacred or beyond the reach of technological interference. Lastly, going back to Derrida, he said in his Spectres of Marx, 1993, although it comes from the past and has a legacy, the specter is unpredictable and especially irreducible. The companionship of ghosts like the living beings they once were, cannot be commanded. 
Against all odds, they might just happen to prepare pizza and Italian sushi. And who knows, they might not be bothered to reply all to your questions. Um, so, ultimately, however, entropy will get us in the long run or in the short run. <laughs> in the meantime, whether or not there is a hereafter, we live here and now. So we must make the most of our time by making every day, every encounter, every relationship count. For that is where the true meaning of life is found. And here is my eternity. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everyone. You may talk to me again 50 years from now. <laughs> Speak the reply tomorrow. And then you can click the, the mic. And then you can ask questions. And my avatar will answer. <laughs> I'll be your ghost. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marlon. But before others, I ask you a question. So please put the title slide back on. Um, the, so Marlon, since you're such a charming man, <laughs> and, uh, and one of our professors, and uh, since you inspired many people, I think it, we need to create five, at least five avatars. Is five is our holy number. So is that going to be okay with you? Do you give consent I, on I, the video camera here? Uh, this is for eternity as part of your digital future. As you have said, I would rather have my clones. <laughs> five clones? Five clones? <laughs> Will that be okay? Only five? <laughs> that depends on who would like to have my clone. <laughs> I don't know, so of course. Uh, it may be really tempting, of course, uh, especially an expert like you, who would like to learn from you in the future. A digital avatar may be very tempting to create. Yeah. Very tempting to create. That's what was mentioned in one of the slides. You may still be contributing to, uh, to the common heritage of humanity, like uh, uh, knowledge, uh, improvement of knowledge, or among other things. But again, the parameters are not clear. The precautionary principle says if you're not, you cannot foresee effects. You have to think twice before doing it. But unfortunately, uh, that may not be the case in technology. Uh, yesterday, I was reading the net. Uh, I was, remember last year I was talking about gene therapy. Uh, gene editing with yeah. the case of Dr. He. I was following in the case of Dr. He. And I was glad to, to know what happened to the two, to the queens that were edited. But, uh, apparently, we do not know. And even Dr. His whereabouts are unclear. He's missing. Because maybe, probably, uh, if they can have an avatar of Dr. He, if he's still alive. <laughs> We get to know what he did in his experiment because his research has not yet been published. So we never know what he did. Thank you, Marlon. Yeah, thank you, Marlon. There was another clone of you speaking in the back. Okay, so please, uh, one at a time. One clone is a rule at a time. Elaine, please. We do have time, of course. This is part of it. We are all hungry. Are you hungry? If you're, if we're hungry, I can write email. No, uh, <laughs> you don't have permission to leave a room to six, two after six. I see. Oh, okay. Well, I have forty-five minutes. I'm joking. Marlon, um, as you know, probably, if you look at uh, Alan Turing's work, uh, he made a comment. If you look at the technical stuff, it's out of this world. But he made a comment that was very important. And he said. When somebody said, well, computers think or have intelligence, his response was, do submarines swim? Uh, and and uh, it takes somebody like Elon Musk, and um, when he talks about uh, AI and so forth, uh, and then he, when someone challenges him and it says, but AI hasn't done this yet, but then, then Elon Musk will say, I'm, I'm talking about Jack Ma, in this case. Jack Ma will say uh, something, and then, Elon Musk says, no, uh, it, it beat Kasparov in 97, and then it beat the GO champion in 2010, and so now we're getting closer and closer to where all of the ideas 
that, that all of the barriers to AI and to human intelligence it, are dropping away and AI is going to take over. Here's the problem, and I think Turing's right. I think Jack, uh, uh, I think Jack Ma's wrong in his questioning, but he's right in the fact that we don't know. I think Elon Musk is wrong. Uh, uh, until we can actually define intelligence and thinking, uh, we, don't, we don't have any idea what an artificial intelligence yeah. would even look like. Yeah. Uh, so even if we say that it can beat somebody 10 times in Go, just being able to do Go is not the only human characteristic that we have. Yeah. The same thing with the, with the um, submarine swimming. Uh, so if you look at, say, David Deutsch, he's a quantum uh, uh, physicist, quantum computers, and when we look at, uh, when they talk about reality or uh, brain states, uh, the, the quantum physicists say very clearly that these are not digital, these are not computational states. And if that's true, then we, we don't know exactly what, uh, what's going on. Now, I think what's happened is the reverse has happened. I think when, in the 1940s and 50s, when they said the computer has memory, they projected memory like a human, a very human thing, or intelligence onto the machine. And then now cognitive science is projecting that back onto the human. I think this is the error. Can you comment on that? That's why in one of the issues and concerns that I raise is uh, the broader context and the humanity of the technology. So the submarine swim, or definitely it's not in the nature of submarines to swim. So it's the same thing with the technology probably. If about AI, we have an expert on AI here, <laughs> Professor Wicker, can help us on AI. He knows everything about it. <laughs> but uh, again, the main issue, the main problem I have with, I have with uh, augmented eternity and how we treat our digital remains is uh, it's really the context, and the humanity, and the technology. No matter how much we approach technology, or no matter how much we humanize it, it, it is not human. It is you know, It remains artificial. The problem with, our, with that is people perceive it to be real, and they live according to what the reality they perceive is. And they behave as if what they see digitally is real, and technology dictates the movements of their lives. Like many other young people now, they cannot live without it. Uh, our students cannot live without it. They would rather be late in class than leave their cell phones behind. So for example, when they go to class and they left their cell phone at home, they would run home, be absent or be late, and then come back to school with their cell phones. So because their reality is already the technology. People commit suicide because of what they see. Young people commit suicide because of what they see. And they hear and they read the technology because they perceive it to be real for them. Even young kids in school, they talk about things that you, you'll be surprised. Why are they talking about it? Like uh, the people, young people, creators will say, "It's so stressful. I want to die." These things because they see it also you know, in uh, online. Can I have just one, one, one go again? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the dangers of what, or what you were talking about earlier. I don't think. I, Physicists don't see any way right now that machines going to take over human intelligence. Uh, but they can go faster, you know, if you have like, uh, you know, five exaflops of memory that it can do, you know, so many calculations, it's, um, it would take us a million years, right? So, but again, that's not, that's not what a human being is. I think that, but what the dangers of AI are is this out of control kind of um, machine system that begins to take its own kind of life, even even if it isn't intelligent. You know what I mean? It can start writing its own code, it can, you know, uh, create these bots, and, you know, and then you have people who are, you know, with this malfeasance kind of idea, then that can, that'll be the problem, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Becker, what do you probably would like to enlighten us on AI. Yeah, I just want to go to this issue of, and it sort of fits in with Ryan's last point too, um, about whether machines or computers can think in the way that, well, getting back to um, what Turing said, and I interpret this a little bit differently. If you say, um, can, a, 
can a submarine swim? I'd say, yeah, obviously, in a, in a sense, it can. And who, but who cares whether it can or can't? We know what it can do. And I think that was really um, Turing's point when he said that it didn't, well, I'm not sure he said really that, um, well, he did say it was sort of a senseless question because what's important is what a machine can do, not whether there's some mental state inside of it that's like a human state. And I think it's sort of the Wittgensteinian point, really, that, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it can think or not, it's what it does that's important. And um, what's his name? Faridi, too, argues that um, computers can't be intelligent, but that they can be smart. And he thinks that's an important distinction, but to me, I mean, okay, they might be intelligent, but they still might be a lot smarter than us to do, do a lot of nasty things to us. So, in a sense, the question of whether they can think or whether they are intelligent, I think, is it doesn't really matter. In the same way, it doesn't matter if we say it, um, submarine can swim or not. Okay. Uh, yes, Ryan. Um, I'd like to comment uh, on the basis of the phenomenological uh, critique on AI by uh, Hubert Dreyfus. Um, Dreyfus is saying that uh, we cannot really understand our own behavior. And the uh, way machines think is the way human beings actually understand objects. And in that sense, AI really cannot be equated to human intelligence because live experience is different. To be able to understand, uh, we must be able to have that experience of being in the world in the Heideggerian sense, of, meaning to say live experience is phenomenological. And in that sense, uh, while machines have AI, that is objective reality. And as you pointed out, the uh, human reality is phenomenological. We need to experience, and in that sense, uh, there's really no way that we can reduce uh, the sense of us, the sense of, of life as it is, in terms of its meanings, to these uh, objective ways that, uh, in the same manner that machines will be able to compute. While a, a, a machine, a computer, can defeat uh, another man in playing chess, the excitement, the enjoyment, and of course, the things that you anticipate in playing is something that can never be captured by machines. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Once the to context. The context. Well, technology is beneficial. Definitely, we cannot deny the benefits that we enjoy because of technology. And you know, today probably you cannot live a, well according to standards of the world a good life without the machines. Now, we know for a fact that uh, even in medicine, medicine becomes easy uh, has become easier and more comfortable, I believe, operation because of machines and artificial intelligence. But then, technology is a double-edged sword. Uh, we may benefit from it, but at the same time, there are things that may be compromised that we may not even aware of. Even the developers of technology are not even aware of the possible sum that are not even probably aware of the, cannot even predict the possible bad effects of the technology that they are creating. And then the problem is we react to the bad effects, because the bad effects are already there. Uh, although, as I have said, I'm also a techno-savvy person. Uh, I love technology. But uh, I can regulate myself when to use it and when not to use it. it. It was not difficult for me to deactivate my FB account and you know, stay FB free for five months. And I think I have a better sleep at night <laughs> without the FB. Less stressful because I'm, I don't see posts on politics and things like this in the Philippines, which I'm quite sensitive about. So when I was an FB, I believe I was being surveillance by the government because of my <laughs> posts on politics and things like this. But then now I'm, I feel better. But I still, I still use technology for other purposes, especially in healthcare. Because I, I like it when technology is used in healthcare. Uh, but things like this, there are consequences that are too far to, uh, that are too difficult to predict, that are difficult to predict. And that makes the development of the technology more free, since there are no questions, there are no regulations, there are no restrictions. 
they are given full freedom to develop whatever technology they would like to develop. Uh, do I advocate strict restrictions or strict uh, policies against it? I do not know. Uh, it's quite new. It's quite new. probably the last five years or even four years ago. When I encountered it, I was a little bit surprised and interested at the same time. I was smiling while I was reading some texts and some philosophers are actually trying to create uh, ethical principles that may govern such uh, technologies. But still, there's no consensus on it because it's very young. Although there are already investments on it, like for example, the Eternity is already a billion dollar business. The businessmen and rich people have already enrolled. I have to pay, by the way, <laughs> since I cannot pay. It's just a free account. It will be deactivated in one month. <laughs> Since I can, it's quite expensive, it's quite expensive, but it's available and only those, again, on social justice, only those who can pay can, can have access to the technology. So. Any other comments or questions? I have a quick question for John. This is kind of interesting because I... Yes. So, um, take for example, in, um, I guess it was in the 1940s or 50s when B.F. Skinner wrote his book, you know. And the response from Chomsky uh, came that uh, there's actually innate structures that from which the language is coming from and, and it, these are not learned you know, points. It, so my, I have a question that's coming from this. Uh, clearly in this case, if we go with, um, so if we go with Chomsky and Port Royal and Galileo going back, uh, uh, the seat of the linguistic ability would be the human being, human being. And of course, we could also say the seat of consciousness, the location of consciousness. Uh, in the case of arguing uh, if, if AI is intelligent or not, or if it's smart, uh, I actually, I, I, I perceive uh, a Turing as saying that this is an irrelevant question that human beings are in their own kind of unknown area, we know how the machine works. But if he was saying it doesn't matter, I think that he, this is wrong in my, my thought. Here's why. Because we can throw away a submarine. If we make a human being, if we, were, if we, if we project back onto the human being that we're just machines, then yeah, can you answer that, that, uh, that dilemma? Uh. Well, I mean, part of it, with your uh, question had to do with the interpretation of Turing, and I interpret him as um, sort of in a bit Wittgensteinian way, uh, which perhaps I'll say a bit about tomorrow, but I won't be now. Um, but in this, it seems to me that some of these questions um, about um, yeah, about, the, about artificial intelligence um, and how similar or different it is to human intelligence don't matter because what matters, I mean, okay, it might matter with respect to giving an account of what a human is. I don't think it matters much with respect to um, how we should regulate it or what we should develop or so on because that's going to... That's what's going to affect us uh, the most, I think. So, so in your opinion, the, the human being stays in that. It's just we regulate the system according to how it operates. Something like that, but I might say more about it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marlon, any concluding comments? In conclusion, thank you very much. <laughs> no, but uh, if you have some other questions, I, I forgot to put my email ad, but uh, if you may want to communicate with me. I think we have it here on the... Yeah, I have it in the... Uh, it message. Yeah, it's a book of abstract, but I don't have abstract there. <laughs> thank you very much.